Amen. That has been something that we've been talking about and thinking about for a while and uh, something Pastor Tyler's really excited about. Uh, we're all are, but I mean, he's been over the moon excited about getting this started. And so really pumped for that. You may not be aware, they've, they've fostered, I don't know how many kids so far, uh, but this week, uh, Micah became theirs uh, permanently. So that was... We got to be there in the courtroom, and man, I got to tell you, that was a special, special moment, and so we rejoice with that. Uh, so good morning. morning. Well, good morning to those that are watching online, good morning to those watching at our Ocon campus. We're excited that you're joining us today as well, uh, but we're excited for today. Uh, last week was, was exciting, right? We had... Um, we had our Good Friday service, which was just off the hook. If you weren't here, I'm sorry. You missed an incredible, incredible service. Um, that was the highest attendance Good Friday service we'd ever had. Uh, Saturday, we had our uh, helicopter candy drop. And uh, for anything that we know, at least, it was the largest attended helicopter candy drop we've ever had. And then we had Sunday. And uh, we had last year was the highest attendance Sunday we'd ever had for Easter. Uh, we beat it by almost 200 people this year, by the way. So it was just an amazing weekend. So thank you for all that served and helped make that possible. Um, let's pray this morning. Father, we just rejoice in you. God, you are a good, good father. And we just rejoice in you. We ask that you would speak to our hearts today. God, that you would open our ears, that you would open our hearts, that you would help us to hear what you would have to say for us today. God, it was so important what the cross says to us, not just for our past, uh, taking care of our sin problem, not just for our future to take care of our eternity, but for our present. Lord, your cross and the empty tomb, it speaks loudly today. God, help us to hear what you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, our bottom line for Easter and really for this three-part series uh, is this. Actions speak louder than words. Right? Like the cross and the empty tomb are audible. Like they speak to us without a word, without uttering a single syllable, they speak to us very loudly. And that's what we're talking about in this series. So Jesus' words, while he was physically on the earth, uh, they were beautiful words. Uh, he uttered powerful words. He said things like, no one can have greater love than to give his life for his friends. He said things like, I am the good shepherd. Uh, you know, the, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He said things like, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. He said things like, do to others what you would have them do to you. Powerful words, beautiful words, words that spoke loudly in that culture. Like they, he said things that just blew them away. But then he backed it up with some action, which made them even more powerful. His actions on the cross and in the tomb, they spoke louder than his words. In fact, uh, those actions confirmed what his words had been saying. Uh, and his actions today, they speak to us in different ways at different times. And last week we talked about how the cross speaks to our past. That it tells us, like, I need help. Right? We look at the cross and we can't, we can't look at the cross and say, I can get to heaven on my own. No, we actually look at the cross and say, I need help. There are things I can't do on my own. Uh, we look at the cross and we hear, I am loved. Like, that's not the actions of an unloving, uncaring Heavenly Father. No, those are the actions of a very loving, caring Heavenly Father. Uh, we look at the cross and we see the message or hear the message that Jesus paid the price. Uh, and then, too, we concluded that the empty tomb, it speaks to us, that it tells us that it's true. Uh, it's not enough just that uh, it's good. It's, it's, it's that it's true, that, that Jesus truly rose from the dead. Now, next week, we're going to talk about how the cross and the empty tomb speak to our future. And I'm excited about that. But today, I want to talk about how the cross and the empty tomb speak to our present. And here's our bottom line for today. The power that made Easter possible empowers me. The power that, makes, that made Easter possible empowers me. And we're going to talk about that more as we go along. But if we could simply understand the impact of the gospel on our daily life and not just as a one-time event, I believe it could transform us, absolutely transform us. Because the gospel isn't just good news, 
because it provided salvation for us, because it took care of our past problem, our sin problem. It's not just good news because of that. It's not just good news because of what it provides for our future in, in an eternal home. It's good news because of what it empowers us to do today and how it empowers us to live right now, not just past and future. Uh, there's so much more available to us than m- what most of us are experiencing. There's so much more available to us in the gospel than what we're currently experiencing. I like how our chosen devotional put it. Now, by the way, if you weren't here last week uh, on Easter, we gave away a, a little devotional book called Chosen. If you weren't here, there's still some more available. Uh, you can pick one up on your way out. But it said, and I'm going to quote it a few times today, but this particular quote says, saying that I already know the gospel, I've heard it all before. Like, have you heard somebody say that? Like, yeah, I got it. I know, Jesus died on the cross for me, rose from the dead, so I get that salvation. Like, I've heard it before. Thank you. Like, I know it. I know the gospel. Saying I already know the gospel, I've heard it all before, is like someone thinking that they know what's going on in outer space because they've looked up at the night sky. Yes, you can see its beauty instantly, but it would be silly to think that your glance helps you even begin to comprehend everything about the storms of Jupiter and the supernova explosions in deep space. In the same way, there are depths of beauty in the gospel that must be explored, and to do this very act of exploration strengthens the faith of the believer like no other practice. Just because you've experienced the gospel doesn't mean you know the gospel and it's all of its implications. See, the cross and the empty tomb have more to say to us than simply what it says to our past. The, go- the gospel wants to impact our every day, like every single day. So what are some things that the cross and the empty tomb say to our present circumstances? So we're going to start with the cross. The cross says that God's plan often looks very different than ours. Have you discovered that yet? Like often. Uh, If I were to give you the task of what providing salvation for all of mankind would look like, what would you come up with? Had you never heard of the cross, had you never heard of Christianity, what would you come up with? And I, I dare say, none of us would come up with the cross. What we would come up with is what every other man-made religion has come up with, and that is, how do I appease a creator? How can I make up for my shortcomings with God? What can I do? We'd, we'd, We'd answer those kind of questions. How do we settle accounts with God? We are completely incapable of coming up with such a plan as the cross. Now, because that is true, Should it surprise us that in our present day circumstances that his plan often looks very different than ours? If it's different for salvation, don't you think, I mean, should it surprise us that his plan for our everyday days is also often very different? And I say often really just to throw you some, you know, some credit uh, that you might have come up with one time on one day, something that looked remotely similar to what God had planned for your day. But most of us, It's almost every day. It's just not the same at all. Uh, I believe it would help us to have, if we had the same attitude that Jesus had when the cross was approaching, he said this, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering. Please take this suffering away from me, yet I want your will to be done, not mine. If we could have that attitude in our everyday days, we would be shocked at what impact that could make in our lives. Right, Because it, it, it shouldn't, but it surprises me how often that I've met someone uh, that they believe when they give their lives to Christ or when they gave their life to Christ that they should not have to, you know, like, like that ended my suffering. I prayed a prayer. It took care of my sin. No more suffering for me. Uh, and, and most people that I've met, they actually wouldn't say that in so many words. But what they do say is like, Why? Like, I got, I got saved. Like, I believe in Jesus. I love Jesus. Like, why did this happen? And what they're really saying without saying it is, he owes me. Like, I gave him. I love him. I serve him. He owes me more than that. But we wouldn't really say it that way. But that's what we're saying. 
is that I shouldn't have to suffer. I should have good now that I love Jesus. And I'll just tell you this, God never promised that. He never promised that you wouldn't suffer. He promised that you would. Those are the pr- I've never went in to somebody's refrigerator and, and saw that promise on their magnet. I've seen lots of promises of God and artwork. I've never seen that one. We should like design one and make it beautiful and say, God promised me problems. <laughs> God promised me struggles. God promised me suffering. And maybe we shouldn't because we'd go broke because nobody wants to buy that promise. But it's a promise that God has made that you're going to suffer. Romans 5.3 says, though, that we can rejoice in our trials. How are you doing with that one? Now, you, you do need to notice, though, that it doesn't say rejoice for your trials. If you rejoice for your trials, you're masochistic, right? That, that, that's not cool. That means that you, you enjoy pain, you enjoy suffering. That's I don't think he wants us there. He doesn't say rejoice for your sufferings, but he does say rejoice in them. That means that in your, when you're in the middle of your suffering, you can rejoice. Why is that? Because his promise as it regards the suffering isn't that you won't have it, it's that you will have it, but that he would be with you and that that would be enough. So we can rejoice in our sufferings because he's with us and we can rejoice. Romans eight seventeen says... If we're going to share in Christ's glory, and what an incredible promise that is, that we can share in his glory. But it says if we're going to share in his glory, that we're also going to share in his sufferings. Again, that's, we usually have some verses you go, like, we quote, like, Romans 8, 17a. That's, that's how I put it. It's just the first part of the verse. We like to leave that second part out, like, and we also rejoice. You know, we also can share in his sufferings. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. In a recent sermon, Pastor Stephen Furtick said this. He said, when I see how God has used uh, even things that I wouldn't choose, it's not that I wanted it to happen. It's not that it doesn't hurt. But I wouldn't trade my scars for anything because my scars are the proof of his power. So when we look at the scars in our life, usually it takes a little bit, you know, one for a scar to develop. That means it's healed. Uh, But when we get past the point, we can look back and we can look at those scars in our life and we can look back and be thankful because it's actually proven his power. It's actually proven that he was with me and that is powerful. So I have uh, a promise for you that his plan just might include some suffering somewhere along the way. In fact, his plan most likely includes some form of suffering along the way. And here's the truth. Suffering doesn't mean that you've sinned. Jesus suffered. Suffering doesn't mean that God's mad at you. Jesus suffered. Suffering doesn't mean that God doesn't care. Jesus suffered. Suffering doesn't mean that you're somehow walking outside of God's will. Nope. Jesus suffered. Suffering instead points us, trust God. Like you can't handle this on your own anyway. Just trust God. Trust God. Keep your eyes on him. Have a nevertheless kind of faith. In fact, I will tell you this. The people that like their life just goes well, it's always up and to the right. One, they don't exist. But if they did, (laughs) if that person existed, that family existed, their testimony would not be inspiring. Like, it's not hard to trust God if everything's always up and to the right. Uh, But here's the truth. That would be a boring testimony. In fact, uh, think about it in the terms of a movie, right? If, If you go watch Avengers this week and in the first five minutes they solved all the problems and then the rest of the movie was all about how life is just good now, like nobody would have seen it or... Uh, nobody would have been talking good about it. It's because there's all this uh, rhythm of bad and good and bad and overcoming and overcoming uh, horrible, bad situations, and then we, we can be victorious in that. That's life uh, here on this earth. And so don't give up. And we have to learn from Jesus on the cross. We don't give up. Aren't you glad he didn't give up? He endured. 
In fact, here's what we would say to you if you're suffering today. This is what he would say to you if you're suffering today. My grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in your weakness. The New Living says, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. See, we like to think like when we're at our best, uh, like God can use us the most. That's not what it says. Because when you're at your best, you're trusting in you. But when you are weak, you create an opportunity for God's strength to be demonstrated through you. And that is when you're actually at your best, is when you're completely relying and trusting. When you know, I can't do this, there's no power in me to overcome this, but I'm trusting in you and relying in you and giving you my all. When we're in that situation, then his power works best in our lives. See, the power that made Easter possible, it empowers us. What happened on the cross isn't what our plans would look like at all, but the cross reminds us without a word That God's plans are often, usually, very different than ours. And they are better plans than ours in the long run. Not always in the short. Not always in the short run do they feel good, do they look good, do they have the impact we want. But in the long run, his plan is always better than ours. The second audible message from the cross is, the cross says that he values you for you, that he values you personally, individually, for who you are. Anybody ever struggled with your self-worth? Have you ever felt like like you weren't appreciated, like no one appreciates me, no one wants me? You ever felt left out, rejected? Anyone in Oconomowoc this morning, uh, have you ever struggled with why would anybody like want to hang out with me? Have you ever felt any of those messages? If you will listen to what the cross says without uttering a word, I believe you'll you'll discover a message there that will transform your life, that will forever change that, your worth. See, the king of the universe valued you so greatly that he sent his son to die on a cross for you. And here's a great question. If you are greatly valued by the king, Personally, Like if the king of all the universe values you as an individual, knows your name, knows everything to know about you, knows the number of hair, hairs on your head. And for some of us, that's not very hard, Matt Block. But here is the <laughs> truth. I love you, Matt. But if you're greatly valued by the king, does it really matter if you're undervalued by others here on this earth? Maybe in the moment. But the reality is if we're truly valued by him, it should impact the way we're valued and the way we experience that value. Uh, Again, I like what the author from Chosen, what he said uh, in this book. Our significance, he says, is no longer measured by social media likes or followers. Our significance is no longer measured by our relationship status, our looks, or how we dress. Our significance is no longer measured by how far we climb the ladder at our job or how much money or possessions we're able to attain. Our significance is no longer based on what we do, but instead on whose we are. Like that's where the value gets determined. See, if you determine your value from the ever-changing standards of the world, I mean, for those of us that have been around for a little bit, right, this is, uh, tomorrow's my birthday, I will celebrate my last birthday before 50, come on. Uh, you know, so, yeah. but I will say this, like the standards have, have anybody that's been around for a little bit, you understand that the standards have been very different at different times and different seasons of our life. And if you determine your value from the ever changing standards of the world, you will often feel inadequate and insecure and unsure But when you determine your worth from the never-changing stability of God's love and grace as demonstrated on the cross, it can leave you feeling unshakable. Like you know you have worth because the cross says I have worth. The cross says that he values me. The cross says that he loves me. So when we understand our worth coming from that, it can change everything. So what does the cross 
say about who I am and whose I am. And the cross says that I am a friend of God. The cross says that I am more than a conqueror through Christ who loves me. The cross says that I'm a new creation, that the old me is gone, that the new me is here. The, the cross says I'm a child of God. The cross says I am God's workmanship, that I am able to do all things through him. I am filled with Christ's joy, that I'm chosen by God, that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, that I'm worth dying for, and that I am worthy of empowering. That's what the cross says about every single one of us. The power that made Easter possible empowers me. Now, the value of an object is determined by what someone is willing to pay for it. And I, you know, that, I was trying to think of a good example of you know, somebody valuing something so much that they would pay a ridiculous amount and like I wouldn't pay anything for because I don't value that. And, and I came across this piece of artwork that um, the guy's name is Barnett Newman. Uh, the art piece is called One Mint Six. Uh, and it's basically, this is what it looks like. I should have brought a picture, I didn't. It is a solid blue rectangular square. It's not, there's no gradient of color. It's a beautiful blue square with a wide white line perfectly in the middle from top to bottom. That's it. It looks like my half of my ping pong table at home. <laughs> and I seriously mean that. That is what it looks like. And a few years back, someone paid $43.8 million for that. For something I would have zero. Like there's no way. I would take it as a gift and turn around and sell it for whatever I could get out of it. I mean, there is no value whatsoever for that. But the value is determined by what some fool was willing to pay for it. You know, because, and actually, there had to be at least two people that were willing to pay something close to that, or he would have got it for a lot less. So there's at least two fools in this story. But $43.8 million. And I will just tell you this. If I'm the artist and I painted that, as soon as the one guy bought it, I said, hey, I'll cut you a deal. For $40 million, I'll paint you another one. I mean, I got it. Take me 10 minutes <laughs> while you wait. All right, we'll paint this thing. But the value is determined by what someone's willing to pay for it. God was willing to pay the highest price ever paid for anything for you. Which speaks to your value. And he values you for you. Why did he do that? For we are God's masterpiece. Poema. We are God's Poem. We are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. See, the cross cries out how much God values you for you. Not for your past, not just for your past and your future, but for your present. It leads us to our final point this morning, and I think the one that uh, I hope you shout over at some point today, is that the empty tomb declares that God's power is enough. Whatever your situation, whatever your problem, whatever's going on in your life, the empty tomb says his power is enough. It's enough to transform you. It's enough to set you free. It's enough to provide whatever needs to be provided in your life. Because your problem, however great, your situation, no matter how dire, it's not worse than the, than the tomb and Jesus being dead. Right? Whatever your problem, it's not that big a deal compared to that. And if his power is enough to raise Christ from the dead, his power is enough to deliver you from whatever your problem is. It's great enough. If you've ever been in a situation where your need is great but your power is little, right, it can be frustrating. But be encouraged. Enough power is available. Romans 8.11, the spirit of Christ who raised Jesus from the dead, hear this, lives in you. Done. Mic drop. Done. Like that, if we get that, you don't have to read the rest of the scriptures I have this morning. If you got that in your spirit, like it could transform everything. The same spirit who rose Christ from the dead, if you are a Christ follower, now lives in you. Hello, wake up. That's what it says. That's amazing. And, and if that wasn't amazing enough, it says, and just as. Whew, I get it. I got tinglies, right? Just as God raised Christ from the dead. Just as means in the same way. Equivalent to. Just as God raised Christ from the dead, he will give life 
to your mortal bodies by this same spirit living within you. Like that's powerful. What does that mean? It means the same power that made Easter possible empowers you. That's what it means. Among other things, this power is available to give us understanding, right? Because if you've ever met somebody like, I just can't understand the Bible. Well, guess what? The same power that raised Christ from the dead now lives in you to help you understand. If you are Christ, if, you're, if you are, have, have prayed and, and repented and asked Christ to come into your life, that power now lives in you. Ephesians 1, beginning with verse 18, says, I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope that he has given to those he called, his holy people who are, rich, who are his rich and glorious inheritance. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. In case you, didn't miss, in case you missed it, the last scripture, he said it's the same power. That raised Christ from the dead now lives in you. And so the Apostle Paul wrote about God's resurrection power that's at work in you. In you. He's at work in us once we receive the gospel. Once we believe and receive the gospel, then that work is now at work in us. See, on a daily basis, God is working in us. And he's making available to us incredible power to help us follow him. We may not always see it. We may not always feel it, but it's there. Oh, that we could understand that. We're not left to our own efforts on a daily basis. The same power that rose Christ from the dead now lives in us. We have enough power for whatever the need is in our life. See, the power that made Easter possible empowers me to understand. And the thought that this brought to my mind is... uh, was actually having a smartphone. And the thought that I had was, uh, if you gave my father, Lee Pope, a smartphone. And what would happen if you gave my dad, who has a flip phone, if you gave him a smartphone, and this isn't true of all of my father's generation, uh, but it's true of my father. And so if it's not true of you, if you're here and you're in my dad's generation, it's not true of you. This isn't bashing on older people. I'm just bashing on my father, okay? (laughs) And I'm not really bashing on him. He's a very intelligent person in most arenas, uh, but not in this one. And, And so if you gave my father a smartphone, he would have incredible potential in his hand that he would only use for making phone calls. Literally, would only use for making phone calls. That's it. But he would have incredible potential in his hand. Like, within his hand is the ability to check on sports scores for any athletic event on the planet, pretty much. You can find at some point, and he could do that. He's not going to do that. All he's going to do is use it for a phone call, if you teach him how to do that. Uh, Because if you don't teach him how to do that, he's going to look at a flat with no numbers and go, like, I don't understand, what do I do? But if you taught him how to use it, he could use it for a phone call. Now, how does that relate to the gospel? I think it's like this. Uh, We have incredible potential, minimal impact. What what my dad would have with a smartphone in his hand, he would have incredible potential, but it would have minuscule and minimal impact in his life because he doesn't know how to access and use the power that's available. That's the gospel in our life, is that it has incredible exponential power available to impact our daily life, not just on Sundays, not just on a day that we prayed and asked and he came in and he saved us, but on a daily basis, we have the potential in our hands, in our lives, the same power that raised Christ from the dead is living in us and we're just making phone calls and sending a couple texts. And he's going, I've got all this potential for you. Don't let it be minimal impact. This grace from God, this power from God is way more. It's for way more than just forgiving your sins. It's for way more than that. And and it's not just for that. It's not just for providing salvation. It's not just for a one-time event. This power that God has in our life is for living. It's not just to take care of our sin problem. It's not just to make sure that we have a home in heaven. It's for changing our everyday days right now. 
empowering that. The power to overcome addiction is available because of the gospel. The power to win the battle against temptation resides in me. Do I know how to access it? The power to love my spouse as Christ loved the church. The power to endure suffering. The power to forgive your abuser. The power to be God's witnesses. All that power is available. It all resides inside me because the same power that raised Christ from the dead now lives in me. The power to find meaning and purpose, that power lives in me if I follow Christ. The power that made Easter possible empowers me. And, and hear this quote from, from Chosen. It is inconceivable to think that the same spirit which raised Christ from the dead would come into our lives and do nothing. Think about that. Like that's inconceivable. That God would have gone to all this effort to provide salvation for us and that that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, when he comes and resides inside of us, goes, oh, you're, you're good. No, he came to do something in our lives, right? That it could have incredible potential but minimal impact. No, there's incredible potential and incredible impact if we'll let it. So here's the question. Are you accessing that power? Or are you just playing? I learned how to play solitaire this week. <laughs> Incredible potential. Minimal impact. Here's the question. Are you accessing that power? Part of the reason for that power is to give you understanding, to help you understand. But part of that is also kind of a, a, a step two is he gives us power to grow. Right? Not just to understand it, but to grow. Colossians 1, 9 through 14. So you have not stopped praying. We have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge, help you understand his will, and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord. First comes understanding, then comes growth. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord, and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while you will grow as you learn. Understanding comes first, then comes growth. We will learn to know God better and better. We also pray that you will be strengthened with all his glorious power so you will have all the endurance and patience you need. I like that part where it says that you may be strengthened with all his glorious power. That takes us back to there's enough power. There's no more power that God has than that was demonstrated in the tomb. It was all, he has all power. That was all power being demonstrated in the tomb. He doesn't like he has more. He has all of it. If you have all of something, there's no more to be had. He's got all of it. And all that power, all that potential now is inside of you. Why is that true? Because his spirit is inside of me. If his spirit's inside of me, it's not like we just have a little of that. We have him. It all is there. It's just whether or not we have learned to access his power. The power that made Easter possible, it empowers me. Not to stay the same, it empowers me to grow. And I think when we look back over our faith journey, you know, maybe we can see more clearly how God's been working. I don't know about for you, this is the way it works for me. Is that oftentimes, like, in the moments, in the days, like, I don't know, I don't know if I'm growing. I don't, I'm just kind of going and moving. I'm praying. I'm reading God's word. But I don't know if anything's really happening right now. But then I look back and see some things maybe that I've struggled with in the past that I don't struggle with now. And by looking back, I can go, oh, like, I'm not where I want to be yet. But you know what? I'm not where I used to be. Like there's been some growth. And maybe you've experienced that in the natural. If you go to like a family reunion and some nephew or niece that you haven't seen for a year or two, uh, you see them and all of a sudden it was like you were, you were here and now they're like here. Recently the overtures were here a few weeks ago and they live in, in Africa and they're some of our best friends, but we don't see them but every three, four, five years. And Abe, who's 15 now, the last time I saw him was probably five or six inches shorter than me, 
is now two inches taller than me, which isn't supposed to happen, but they're tall people. And, uh, you know, and so I'm looking up at Abe now, and, and it's like, wow, I'm like amazed. Like this kid is now towering me, and his brother that wasn't here is like 6'6 six, six now, who I didn't even get to see. But, I mean, it's just like this incredible growth. And his parents are just like, uh, like for them, it's no big deal. I, like they haven't noticed that much. Obviously, they know he's grown, but it's not happened like overnight. For me, it's like overnight because I hadn't seen him. Have you experienced that? And maybe spiritually, you're just plodding along, not even recognizing or realizing the things that God's doing in your life. And then somebody that hasn't been around you since you were a real piece of work, uh, they're like, wow, like God, what is, what's going on in your life? You don't even, you're not the same person you used to be. And you're like, really? But if you look back, you can go, I'm not what I used to be. I may not be where I want to be yet, but I'm not what I used to be. And, and so we can see, perhaps we can see best in that way, the power, the, the growth that we've experienced. Because uh, there's enough power to empower our growth, but it, that usually happens slowly over time. Very rarely does God go, you know what, I'm going to take you from here to here overnight. That's not usually even healthy. It's usually not sustainable. You don't have the character developed within you yet to handle being here. Like he's got to do other things to develop the character so you actually have the strength to stand once you get here. So we can't move that quickly. He does things slowly over time so we can have the strength. Something that we need to understand and recognize is this growth that God has for us. See, the empty tomb says there's enough power. Whatever your need, whatever your problem, whatever your situation, the empty tomb says there's enough. There's enough power to see, you, to see you through to the end. There's enough power, the empty tomb says, that he can help you to endure anything. The empty tomb says that he wants you to grow and not just survive. The empty tomb says that God's plan is better than your plan all the time. Uh, the cross says that God values you for you, like we talked about earlier, and it says that God's plans often look very different than your plans, but they're better. His plans are always better. So will you trust him in the meantime? In the meantime, between God taking care of your past and forgiving your sins, and between us going to heaven and experiencing the peace of God for all of eternity, in the meantime, sometimes that can be a really mean time, but in the meantime, Will you trust him? Not just with your past, not just with your future, but with your present everyday days. Because there's enough power available. He doesn't want it just to be a Sunday thing. There's enough power for your Monday. There's enough power for your Tuesday. There's enough power for your Wednesday and your Thursday and your Friday and your Saturday. There's enough power for May and for June and for July. There's enough power for 2020 and 2021 and for all of your days for the rest of your life, you will never exhaust the power and the grace of God. There's enough power available for whatever your need is today. Will you trust him? Every head bowed and every eye closed.